it is by bringing in a more um, educated and appropriate workforce. It is bringing in the women's, you know, so that we can have more of a, a balanced workforce so that we can do a better job with our collective thinking and not be so blindsided and one dimensional with our with our thinking. Hello world, this is Better Tech, a podcast where we chat with some of the most successful leaders about the latest industry developments. So join us as we explore the world reliant on tech. This episode is brought to you by Texel, a leading software development company. Check them out at Texel.com. We are joined today by Jane Franklin, CEO of Cybersecurity Capital and an advocate of women in tech. Welcome, Jane. It's a pleasure to have you on our channel. And before we get into the latest cybersecurity trends, its changing landscape and the role of women in tech, can you introduce yourself to our audience? Hi, everyone. My name is Jane Franklin. I'm an award-winning cybersecurity entrepreneur, a best-selling author and speaker and change activist. Sometimes I say, say I'm a change agent, um, but I've worked in cybersecurity for over 22 years. I've built my own global hacking firm. I've uh, directed some of the world's best known consultancies and worked to help accreditation companies and forums like Crest and Cyber Essentials and OWASP throughout my career. I am a board advisor and a judge for about seven awards globally right now. And I'm featured in the media quite a lot as well. So I'm considered one of the top influencers in cybersecurity um, and one of the top influencers in technology in, in the UK. And I have a company um, which is called Cybersecurity Capital. And what we believe is that a failure to attract and retain women in cybersecurity is making us all less safe. And that only by getting a greater number of women into the industry and remaining in it, will we have right. best, better happiness, um, better security solutions and, and better innovation. So we do trainings and we do mostly with leaders or with women. And we have a platform that's coming out this year which is purely for, for women to help them become stronger and more resilient and impactful. Um, and, and that will have meetups and masterclasses and uh, a facility for, for people to, women to find mentors. So that's kind of who I am and what I do. <laughs> Thank you for acquainting us all, Jane. So you've been in the cybersecurity industry for over 22 years now. How do you think the industry has evolved over time? What changes do you see and what recent developments do you find worrisome? Yeah, well, when I first came into it in 1997, it really was, you know, it was a technical domain, you know, so it was, it was technical. Um, you know, we, there wasn't that as much technology as, as there is now. And, and therefore, there weren't as many solutions and there weren't as, as big an attack surface. Right now, everything has just grown exponentially. So we have more connectivity, more data, we have more legislation to, to take care of. And really right. what I've seen is kind of a move, you know, into um, a move really in addition to the technology aspect into more of the human aspect. So that kind of behavior scientist kind of approach where we're, we're bringing in sociologists and, um, uh, you know, those who understand psychology so that we understand the behavior of people within our organizations who might pose a threat to us or external hackers or criminals that are or, or spies that are wanting to, to come in and, and take from us or, or simply spy on us, you know, wait until they're ready to, to do something malicious or to, to steal. And you recently wrote a book on how the failure to attract women in cybersecurity is making us all less safe. I think we're all interested to know more about the importance of having gender diversity in tech. So can you elaborate on that? Yeah, well, I, the book kind of happened as a bit of an accident. Um, so I just wrote a blog about what I was seeing in the industry. So this was in 2015. And I thought I was going to get crucified for what I wrote. <clears throat> but I thought it's my view. Um, no one could take that away from me. And it just went wild. So in a very positive way. So I kind of wrote 
uh, report and that was 15,000 words. And then I thought, well, actually, let's, if I gather interviews from women, then I can do a better job and be more helpful. So maybe I should turn it into a book. And so I, that's kind of how the book came about. So the book also came about from a Kickstarter project, you know, so I wasn't going to put my time into something if it wasn't wanted. So I got it backed and invested in financially before before I wrote, wrote it. And really what the book was, was a, a research project. You know, I didn't know it at the time because I, I thought it wouldn't take long to write, but it really involved me interviewing and speaking to thousands and thousands of, of women and also men about what's going on and what the situation is like and doing a lot of research into what's going on in our industry and not going on in our industry and needs to go on in our industry and what's going on in other industries so what we can learn from them so it yeah it took much longer it was a it was a real journey it was my first book so I had all of the uh, fears around putting myself you know I'd already put myself out there I was already a, a writer a blogger and and also a vlogger as well so I was quite used to that but there was something kind of special about putting a book out and especially on that topic right. and in our industry which can be quite uh, ruthless and unforgiving <laughs> so so really yeah. with the book the, the kind of premise that I came from um, and and also the the conclusion as well, which which is a good thing, is that women are different to men. Uh, we all know that biologically we're, we're different, and um, but women are different to men. And we know that women in business, um, in any business, are good for business. So they are much more profitable. They um, stay on track when it comes to budgets much more um, than teams that that aren't more balanced. And um, there, there's more there's more diversity. So there's more sharing that goes on. There's more profits. There's more um, yeah production and efficiencies. So all that happens when you have women in any business, particularly in leadership. And you, what you also get is when you have um, women that come into groups, the collective intelligence of a group increases the higher the number of women there are in the group. So it doesn't mean to say that if it was an all-women group, it would be super intelligent. It just means that when there is that gender diversity in the group, the output is far better. The collective intelligence increases. But when we look at security, security is all about making better decisions around risk. And women are different to men. And how this kind of shows up is that women see risk in a different way to men. And there have been hundreds and hundreds of of studies that illustrate this and they're all they're all referenced in in my book and that's that's good for us because that's what we need so we're in the business of, of risk of making decisions around risk and if women see it in a different way an accurate way because we're quite risk averse when we come together with men who can be the other and go in the other direction um you know uh, more happy with risk and tolerate a higher level of, of risk. So they're on the top end, we're on the, the lower end. When we come together, we get a much better and balanced view, a more accurate view of what true risk is. And women are also really embracing of regulations and controls. And so they don't naturally look to technology to fix a solution. You know, what we tend to do is, is look at the full picture rather than jump straight to, to a tech solution, which in, in my view is, you know, has been happening and one of the reasons why we have so many, so many issues. And the other right. thing is um, that women are socially and emotionally um, they score higher when it comes to social and emotional intelligence and um, you know when we look at that and then we look at how they respond during times of turbulence you know so crises and things like that again women traditionally respond better to those kind of turbulent um, times so we're dealing with breaches so when a breach happens we have a natural tendency to remain calm when when that when that occurs. So I don't say that women are better than men at all because that's not the case. Um, and men certainly aren't better than women. But when we come together, then we can just do a better job and we evolve. So that's what the book really is about. And then looking at the changes that we need to make and the inherent mistakes that we are making right now, not necessarily deliberately, 
um, unintentionally, um, but that we need to make in order to get more women in and and remain in the industry. Yeah, definitely. We could use more diversity in the realm of tech. Then coming specifically to the cybersecurity space, what trends do you see taking place in the next five to 10 years? Yeah, well, you know, attacks are going to grow exponentially. They're already, you know, we're already experiencing that now. You know, we've got more AI, more machine learning, more connectivity. We've got the Internet of Things, the Internet of Everything. We've got new privacy laws. You know, we have so much coming at us. You know, it's it's causing us so many problems. So one, we've got to keep up with these technologies. So what I'm finding with leaders is they're struggling to know which ones to buy. And so that's causing them confusion and a confused buyer doesn't always buy. And they are, so we've we've got that going on. We've, We've also got an issue with our workforce. So the media will report that we have a talent um, crisis, you know, a shortfall. And there's a bit of scaremongering going on with that. We do have a shortfall in some areas, but really what needs to happen is we need better uh, data to actually work upon. So we need to look at, we need to do research and find out, well, what exactly is going on? What are the skills that we're lacking in? What, which countries we're lacking in? Because it's not the same across the, across the world. And then how can we go and fix that solution? So, <clears throat> Yeah, exactly. So often we hear that there is, um, you know, say, for instance, when it comes to to women, we need more women in the industry and and things like that. Well, you know, I always encourage the media and people who say that to be more accurate, because say when we look at India, for instance, India has a great number of women that come into the industry at a young age, you know, in schools that they're coding. And that's normal. You know, it's with a country that's built on technology. I think 40% of, of the industry is built on technology. So that's a real skill that already exists. So it's not necessarily a problem for India. So we need to get much more accurate, um, you know, when we report o- upon these things. So that there is, there is a skill shortage in some areas. But what we also need to be doing is we need to be investing. And what we're expecting is a ready-made workforce and also we're out there kind of looking for unicorns. We're not being realistic. We're not approaching the hiring, um, you know, aspect in, in a, in a, in a good, in a good way. And that's, that's causing us the main issues. I think we're doing a much better job on awareness, you know, in our outreach and going out to schools and colleges and just the, the world, you know, the media, um, and actually letting them know what it is and how our industry has evolved and how very diverse it is and that it's not just technology, that there's a lot of, you know, business and, and management um, and kind of language skills that are really needed uh, for our ecosystem. I think we're doing a much better job of that. But when people show an interest, whether they're male or female, what you know I'm noticing is that there's a real problem with the hiring and then also sometimes the onboarding so it's just like setting them up for success so sometimes it's a case of they come in and you know they they don't necessarily have all of the skills that they they need and they're just being left to struggle and there's one thing kind of empowering yourself and going out there and being a self-starter and learner but there's another thing having your company invest in you too to kind of help bridge that gap so that you remain with them and loyal to them and you develop with them (coughs) So, you know, I see those types of, of, of problems, you know, going on. The awareness, for instance, you know, the insider threat, the human aspect has, has always been around. You know, social engineering has, has been around for a long time. Humans invariably make mistakes. Humans don't always know that they are making a mistake. Um, that's always been around. But just the scale of it. I think because the attacks have increased and some of these attacks are more sophisticated and creative, but some of them aren't, you know, they are well known about and they are bog standard, you know, so that whole side of things has, has really exploded. And speaking of what we should be doing, cyber attacks have also considerably evolved. How do you think the new developments in cybersecurity can help combat this? Well, um, 
you know, the, the only way is really through education. So as I said, you know, a few minutes ago, really, it is by bringing in a more um, educated and appropriate workforce. It is bringing in the women's, you know, so that we can have more of a, a balanced workforce so that we can do a better job with our collective thinking and not be so blindsided and one dimensional with our with our thinking so if we bring in the the appropriate skills and we develop we develop them and invest in them then that will help us to really cope with the change that is coming at us um, and and be more innovative and advanced with it but we do need to create these cultures whereby and they are, I talk about high challenge and high support cultures whereby the people coming in are stretched and they are developed and they are encouraged to make, well, not encouraged to make mistakes. They're supported when they do make mistakes. So we're creating these psychologically safe environments that um, help them to progress and learn so that they can be loyal and stay with us and evolve and develop. And this also really helps us with the attacks that are coming at us, you know, whether they are kind of spawned from AI or whether they're, they're not, you know, they're manual combination of manual and, and um, automated or technology or, or AI, um, you know, th things like that can, can really help us because when we have that, they won't be afraid to make mistakes and they will evolve and, and learn and be comfortable with it. And I think one of the, the good, a good example of that was with Marisk, um, you know, when they had, you know, their severe incident a few years ago in 2017, um, the CISO there said, do what's right, you know, for the customer. So um, that was empowering them and, and allowing them to, 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 to do what they knew to be right rather than to kind of be frozen in the headlights, you know, and, and to worry, am I doing the right thing? Well, what if? Because sometimes there can be in, insecurity. We have a lot of scapegoating and we ha have a lot of blame mongering and we have a lot of victimization that invariably will go on. When you remove that and you allow people to do their job and to trust uh, their knowledge and their instincts and their experience, then you get a better result. So it's this creating cultures like that is really important for our industry and also creating leaders that can lead like that because leadership is a skill that is learned and taught. Nobody really is, is born a leader. It's something that you're, you know, you're, you're, you're taught how to be and you need to be refreshed how to be a good leader all the time because invariably you'll get into bad mistake, you know, uh, mistakes, you'll make mistakes and bad behaviours. And in your opinion, how can we equip the C-suite especially to be able to counter this threat landscape and be more open as leaders? Yeah, well, they, I, they need to come to us and we need to, we need to go to them. So they, I think, are interested but I think when they are more accountable, so they take on the risk, so we're not taking on that risk, they are. So we can advise and be more consultative and we can be operational <coughs> in how we deal with that, but they have to own the risk. So really what I want to see is I want to see um, our security leaders, our CISOs and our CSOs and heads of really stepping up and actually becoming empowered and, and reaching out to them, not to, uh, not to put upon them and not to um, police, but actually to, to go out and to want to find out about them. So if they can see the world through their eyes and they can learn about what's going on in their environment, then invariably they will be interested to learn about us and that forms a trust and a connection so that we can find solutions whereby we can both win and then the company wins because we're all there to support the company. But we have to, I, I really do believe believe this with the, with the leadership. We've got really weak leadership and, um, you know, we can step up and change that ourselves. You know, just the other day I was talking to a CISO and what she was saying, she was saying that um, <clears throat> she's in an organization and it's not great. And she's being hampered by her CIO. And 
and she's she she speaks to the board regularly highly competent highly experienced but she's literally gone into the ceo and said if uh, this is he is he's causing me a problem you know he's restricting what i'm what i'm being able to do if i can't do this you're basically in trouble and i'm also not happy with this because i took this job based on a whole lot of promises that you said i have my reputation to think of and if you don't change it I will literally walk away. And when I walk away, I'll bring my team with me or they will follow me. So it's really kind of, I mean, that's quite quite a, an in-your-face approach. Yeah. <laughs> and it's a very bold approach <laughs> that actually she's quite right because, you know, we've got to change this scapemongering that's going on. And we have to, you know, the only way that we can do that is by, by being bold, you know, with our actions. So. I actually quite enjoyed hearing her story and hearing her in no uncertain terms saying, you know, you're causing me a problem. You know, you're causing a risk for the company. It's under your leadership. Um, this needs to happen. You know, you've just appointed the the Premier League team and, and we're dealing with, with, you know, the D team here. So go and sort it out. Otherwise, you know, the Premier team, which is her and her team, will literally walk and they can be picked up by numerous organizations who are crying out for them or go and start their own thing so it's really kind of being very empowered and owning it and saying you need to change this is a problem and getting your voice heard because what tends to happen is our voices as leaders aren't heard or our reports don't get seen or someone else pre presents you know or whatever you know, and when we need to make the changes, because it's not that we don't know what to do. You know, we do know what to do. We're just not being able to do it. You know, so that message really needs to get through. So it is a combination of us stepping up as leaders and and also the and, but approaching that in the right manner from a from a from an open mind from an inquisitive mind from a beginner's mind help me understand what you do i'm interested in you and and your mission um, as opposed to you're doing it all wrong you're being a pain in the backside i can't do my project da, 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 da. it it really has to be you know approach like that and then the other way, you know, let's let's look at what you're doing. And there's a part, there's a part that the board and the non-executive directors can play too, because I really feel strongly that the non-executive directors, they do hold the board accountable. That's their job, one of their jobs. And um, and because the board isn't necessarily up to speed, I mean some boards are, but it's 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 not particularly common you know if they're not up to speed then they need help with that if the non-execs get up to speed then they can the board will listen to the non-execs and they will be coached by the non-execs so for me I kind of think that there needs to be this little triangle or, or circle even better still circle that goes on where where the the executives um, are moving through it uh, coaching and mentoring and advising one another so that the intelligence actually increases and understanding increases. Definitely. The importance of coaching and mentoring should never be underestimated. So that wraps up today's episode. And thank you once again, Jane, for joining us. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thanks for listening to this episode by Better Tech. If you enjoyed this podcast, give it a thumbs up and don't forget to share it across your favorite social networking platform. We look forward to bringing you the latest industry news in our next episode. In the meantime, take a look at our other episodes and hit subscribe with the links in the description box below so that you don't miss out on the latest in tech.